Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes, one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you are worshiping with us today, and we'd love to know that you're here. So if you would, please take a moment and either click the link that is in this video description, or go ahead and scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and also let us know how we can be praying for you. Now I invite you to take a big, deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. Well, we've made it. We've made it to the grandest week of the year for giving thanks. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to each of you watching our service today. One thing I love most about our church are the people. Our congregation is so supportive with your love and your prayers, your volunteering, and especially your generosity, your giving. It's been an exciting year here at Wrightsville. We've had 62 new members join our church just within the last nine months. We have 22 confirmants. We have over 50 kids in our Christmas pageant this year. We've had 18 baptisms. Our staff has grown. All of these exciting things are happening here at Wrightsville. That also means our programs are ever evolving and expanding. We have a new Wrightsful Remix Fellowship and Dinner for Young Families and Children on Wednesday nights. Uh, we have a Mother's Morning Out program starting at the beginning of the year in January. We have a new um, Women's Circle, Grace Circle. We have um, small groups back to be impacted again. If you experience this joyful noise on Sundays in the hallways, you know God is doing amazing things in this building and through all of you. But we still have work to do. And so I just wanted to say thank you for your generosity this year. And may you feel the peace of Christ this Thanksgiving holiday. Happy Thanksgiving. All throughout the fall here at Wrightsville, we've been focusing on digging deep, on really committing ourselves to the journey of discipleship. As a part of that, we have been praying together this prayer, a congregational prayer at the start of all of our worship. And this prayer as a reminder was based on our core values that we determined as a congregation. We're ending now this season of digging deep, but of course our continued commitment to our discipleship journey remains. If you would like to hang on to this prayer and continue to use it in your life, we hope that you will. And I'd just like to remind you that there is a link to the PDF of this in the video description if you'd like to hold on to that and continue to use it. Now, one last time, I invite you to join in sharing this prayer together. God, I want to dig deeper. I love you, and I want to follow you more closely. Help me as I read scripture and practice worshiping you with others. Help me trust that if I just show up, you will take care of the rest. Help me practice compassion to assume that everyone I meet is doing the best they can with what they have. Help me to love the people I don't like and to forgive others like you forgive me. Help me be generous with my time, my skills, and my money. Give me the eyes to see opportunities to give and the courage to say yes. Help me see every person I meet as your beloved child. Help me welcome them exactly as they are without assuming I know what is best for them. 
Holy Spirit, I invite you to work in me. In the ways I have asked or as you see fit, let your will be done in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I will be reading Psalm 46 from the New Revised Standard Version. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens His will to make known. The wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to His name. He forgets not His own. Beside us to guide us our God with us joining in ordaining, maintaining His kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we are winning. Thou, Lord, wast at our side, all glory be Thine. Hello, I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I'm here today to lead us in our morning prayer. 
Uh, during the prayer, I will pause at a certain point to give you the opportunity to speak the names of persons that you would like to lift up in prayer today. Let us pray. Oh God, in a world that seems to have gone crazy and lost its way, we come to you this morning, not just seeking answers, but seeking strength and courage for the days ahead. We acknowledge Jesus Christ as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We pray for courage to be the people who you have called us to be, people who seek justice and peace through your love for all your people. We seem to be a deeply divided people, but as we look and listen to people around the world, so many seem divided and at war with one another, either through words or worse, through acts of violence. Surely we humans must test your patience, but we know that your love is all-encompassing, never-ending, always forgiving. This is our hope, that you love us unconditionally, O Lord. For we know that in the end, it is you who loves us the most and is always there waiting for us. You are our hope for the world, and it is in this hope that we live and move and have our being. We pray today for all those who are struggling in body, mind, and spirit. We especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Hear our prayers, O Lord. As we worship you today, we pray for your mercy and your grace. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray as your confident children, using these words to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we reflect the next few moments on our Christian stewardship, we're reminded during this season of Thanksgiving that our stewardship is rooted in Thanksgiving. We give back to God as people who are thankful for our blessings. You can worship God with your giving by giving offerings at a live worship service, or by mailing checks to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. You can also give through our church webpage and also through our church cell phone app. So let us reflect for a moment on our call to generosity. <laughs> For thy 
thy church forevermore Lift his holy hands above Offering up on every shore His pure sacrifice of love Lord of all to thee we praise This our hymn of grateful praise For thyself best gift divine To the world so freely given For that great, great love of thine Peace on earth and joy in heaven Lord of all, to thee we raise This our hymn of grateful Hello again, it's time now for the children's moment. And if you have children nearby who aren't already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over. I've got some things to share for them. So, hey guys, Pastor David here again with the children's moment. Now, do you know what holiday is coming up this week? That's right, it's Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Uh, we give thanks now to God every day, or we should, but on Thanksgiving Day, we want to especially take, take time to remember all the things that we are thankful for in life. So what are some of the things that you're thankful for? Uh, right, yep, your parents, that's good. Your whole family, yeah, that's, that's a good thing to be thankful for. Um, your doggy? Yes, I bet you are thankful for that cute puppy. Uh, anyone else? Thankful that you have good food to eat? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, those, those are all great responses and just a few of the things that uh, we should be thankful for. Now, when I want to say thank you, whether it's to God or to anyone else, uh, I usually just say thank you because that's how we say thank you in English. But in, in other countries, they say thank you in different ways because they speak different languages. Uh, for example, if I were to say gracias, does anybody know what, what language that is? Yeah, that's right, it's Spanish, yes. And we hear that in not only in Spain, but in Latin American countries and, and even in our own country from uh, immigrants uh, who first language uh, would be Spanish. And, and some of you will be studying that in school. All right, how about if I say, merci, merci. Yep, well, that's French, okay? That's, they speak French in France, and that's how they say thank you. Okay, here's one I bet you might not know. Obrigado, obrigado. Any guesses? No, no, it's not Russian, no. No, that's actually Portuguese. So they would speak that in Brazil and also in, uh, in Portugal itself, where the language uh, originated. How about uh, shukran? Shukran. Yeah, that's Arabic. Um, arigato. Anybody know that? No, that's Japanese. Uh, how about dankeschön? Dankeschön. I heard one of the adults say German, and you're right, that is German. Uh, we remember in our generation back when there was a song called Danke Schön. But you can see that there are many ways to say thank you. And the good news is that our God is very smart, and God understands thank you no matter what language that we're speaking. Because God looks at our hearts, and God knows if we really have a thankful heart or not. It doesn't matter what language we use. The important thing is that we do say thank you 
to God because God has blessed us and helped us in so many wonderful ways. So join with me now as I lead us in prayer and we're going to say thank you to God. Let us pray. Dear God, there are so many things that we're thankful for, but above all, we're thankful for the great love that you have for each one of us. Thank you also for sending Jesus to be our Savior and our friend. We pray that you'll bless all the children and youth in our church and community, all those that are watching this video and their families. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I thank you for taking time to worship with us here on the Vine. We've been reading through the Gospel of Luke throughout uh, this fall. And we've come to the end. And uh, I hope that uh, you have enjoyed reading along with us. And um, we're going to, of course, move into Thanksgiving next week and uh, Advent right around the corner. But uh, let's, uh, let's finish up our story on, uh, in Luke. And today, um, we're not going to quite get to the resurrection. I hope that you, you went ahead and read that. But I want to spend some time on the crucifixion. So I'm in Luke chapter 23, verse 33. When they came to the place that's called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching, but the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanging there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, what a wonderful day you've given to us. And Lord, I pray that in this day and in this hour that you would speak to us once more. And Father, I pray that you will use me in this moment um, to speak your word and um, Where I personally fall short, I pray that you will forgive my misgivings. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you ever gotten really upset with the ending to a book or a movie? Like if the ending is too unexpected or too weak, or if they kill off your favorite character in the end, it could ruin the whole story. In other cases, the ending might even be offensive to some people, but that's a risk you take when you, you know, go to the movies. Here's something you might not know. Movie censors in China are allowed to change the ending of movies to protect Chinese citizens from what they call scenes that might disturb social order or impart criminal methods. For instance, if you're familiar with the movie Fight Club, which starred Brad Pitt and Edward Norton, it has a violent ending. What's the first rule of Fight Club? You do not talk about Fight Club. What's the second rule of Fight Club? You do not talk about Fight Club. Well, I'm gonna talk about Fight Club. Edward Norton's character kills his alter ego, played by Brad Pitt, then a bomb explodes, causing a bunch of buildings to burst into flames. The burning buildings are visual images of Norton's desire to destroy modern civilization. Well, this ending did not make it past the movie censors in China. Before they would show the movie in theaters, they changed the ending. The last few minutes of the movie are completely cut out. The movie ends with a screen image of a large sign that says 
that the authorities won, that the police caught all the bad guys, they prevented the bomb from exploding, Edward Norton's character spent time in an institution where he received psychological treatment, and he, then he was discharged from the asylum in the year 2012. So if you're a big fan of Fight Club, now you know the Chinese version has an unexpected happy ending, and that in China, you do not talk about the real ending of Fight Club. But if we have the power to change the ending through a true story to make it as happy or maybe as chaotic or unexpected as we wanted, would we? Well, there's a genre of books in the publishing world that does exactly that. It's called alternate history or counterfactual history. The authors of alternate history take one major event or influential person in history and they imagine what the world would be like if that event had never happened or if that person had never been born. Um, the book Virtual History contains essays from eight historians answering questions like, what if Germany had actually won World War II? Or what if John F. Kennedy had never been assassinated? And they use a lot of research and their vast knowledge of history to construct a completely different ending to the story. Kind of a mind-boggling idea. What if? What if one major event in world history had never happened? What if 9-11 had never happened? What if Vladimir Putin had never been born? What if he'd never decided to attack Ukraine? More important, what if Jesus had been unwilling to go to the cross? Think about that question as I reread our Bible passage for today from Luke 23, the story of Jesus' death. The passage begins, when they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood around watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. They said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Three times. Three times the accusation was made against Jesus if you were God's Messiah, if you were the king of the Jews, then save yourself and us. It's a deja vu moment for Jesus. He has heard these words before. In Luke chapter 4, Satan presented Jesus with three temptations in the desert and taunted him with the words, if you are the son of God, if you're truly the Messiah. Three times he's given the opportunity to change the ending to the story. Three times, though, Jesus refused. In Matthew 26, Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest. Three times he prays and wrestles with his calling. Three more times he's given the opportunity to change the ending to the story. But three times Jesus refused. And here, as he hung on the cross in agonizing pain, with crowds shouting at him and rulers sneering at him and soldiers gambling over his clothes, Jesus is given three opportunities to change the ending of the story. If you're the Messiah, save yourself. And he refused each time. Why? Well, the people in that crowd that day were questioning the power of the Messiah because they didn't understand the purpose of the Messiah. Our actions define who we are. Not what we say, not what we intend to do, not what we feel. It's what we actually do that reveals our true character, our values, and our priorities. And we're also defined by what we choose not to do. 
1966, a young British woman named Jackie Pulliger became a missionary in the walled city of Kowloon, a place in Hong Kong. It was a place that was notorious for high rates of poverty, drug addiction, and criminal gangs. The city was practically run by these gangs, and Jackie, without any supplies or support of any kind of mission agency, she just began walking the streets of Kowloon and sharing the message of Jesus with all these addicts and prostitutes living on the streets. Over the next 40 years, she brought thousands of people to Christ and established drug rehab centers throughout Hong Kong that have also helped thousands of people escape their addictions. Jackie claims that in the early days of her ministry in Kowloon, her limited language skills may have actually helped her. You see, instead of being able to preach the gospel effectively, Jackie had to show people who Jesus was through her actions. As she said, I found out that the people there weren't really listening anyway. They were watching to see how I acted, whether I really did love them. And if I really did love them, well then, maybe God loves them too. You see, it's what we do and what we choose not to do that reveals our true character, values, and priorities. This is never more true than in a time of crisis. What we choose to do or not to do in that crucial moment reveals who we really are. Our choices to act or not to act can literally change the ending to the story. On Christ the King Sunday, I'd like us to examine what Jesus chose to do and not to do when his life and the salvation of the world hung in the balance. On the cross, Jesus chose to offer forgiveness and mercy for people who didn't deserve it. Jesus had already undergone beatings and humiliation by the soldiers before they nailed him to the cross and hung him there to die. Our passage goes on to reveal that the crowds were watching. The rulers were sneering at him. The soldiers were mocking him. One of the thieves even hurled insults at him. We can't imagine the horror, the humiliation, the agony, the pain, the abandonment that Jesus suffered in these moments. God in the flesh looked on the worst of his enemies, and he chose to forgive them. He set aside wrath in favor of restoration. Carolyn McKinstry grew up in Birmingham, Alabama in the 50s and 60s during uh, a, a really uh, painful time uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. She remembers that her home city was nicknamed Bombingham for the frequent bombings that targeted black homes and, build, and buildings. Carolyn's parents tried to shield her from all the hatred and violence that was so prevalent at the time. Her family attended the 16th Street Baptist Church, where they were surrounded by a loving community of fellow believers. Carolyn was baptized there at the church at the age of 13. Her best friends were all there. On September 15, 1963, it was Youth Sunday at her church. As Carolyn walked into the sanctuary that morning, a bomb went off. The next thing she remembers was the sound of police sirens and screams as people ran into the streets to escape the explosion. Four members of the Ku Klux Klan had planted a bomb in the church that morning. And later, Carolyn would learn that four of her good friends, Addie Mae Collins, age 14, Carolyn McNair, age 11, Carol Robertson, age 14, and Cynthia Wesley, age 14, all died in the explosion. Carolyn's family rarely talked about the bombing. Grief counseling wasn't readily available back then, and so Carolyn learned to suppress her fear and her confusion and her grief into the time she grew to be an adult. But throughout that time, she struggled with depression. She blunted her feelings with alcohol, until finally her husband encouraged her to go get some help. She visited a psychologist who suggested that she needed to deal with something from her past in order to free herself from the grip of depression. And when she got home from the psychologist's office, she went to her closet and she pulled out a box of childhood memories. On top was the Bible that her parents gave her at her baptism back when she was just 13. Carolyn began shaking as she reached into the box. She says she prayed, God, I am in so much pain. Please fix my body. Take away my cravings for alcohol. 
Touch me with your healing so that I can move forward. And as she picked up her childhood Bible, a bulletin fell out. And she picked up the bulletin, and on the front was the date September 15th, 1963. She opened up the bulletin, and she saw the sermon title and the scripture verses that had been planned for that day. The title was, A Love That Forgives. The scripture was Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Carolyn began a journey of forgiveness and healing that day. She prayed that she would be able to see the bombers the way God saw them. She prayed that maybe she could forgive them as God had forgiven her. In fact, Carolyn went on to attend divinity school so she could preach and teach about God's love and forgiveness and reconciliation to others. And in 1978, Carolyn and her family moved back to Birmingham and they rejoined the 16th Street Baptist Church, a church that symbolized to Carolyn God's infinite grace and love for all of his children and how we're given that love in order to forgive what may seem unforgivable and release our burdens. Our actions define us. What we choose to do, what we choose not to do, reveals the truth about us. In Jesus' worst and most agonizing moment, he chose to forgive his enemies and to grant salvation to a dying thief. And on the cross, Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, chose not to save himself, but rather to save humankind instead. In Matthew's version, in chapter 26, when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? All power in earth and in heaven was available to him. He could have changed the ending to the story. He could have saved himself. But he chose to suffer and die in our place to heal our broken relationship with God. The King of Kings took our place so that we could have eternal life. Brennan Manning was an author and a Franciscan priest who served in the Korean War. He tells the story of how he and his best friend Ray enlisted together and they served in the same marine platoon. One night a grenade landed in the foxhole where Brennan and Ray were sheltered. Ray threw his body over the grenade and died in order to save his friend. Years later, Brennan visited Ray's mother in Brooklyn. And in the course of their conversation, Brennan asked her, Do you think Ray loved me? Mrs. Brennan stood up from her seat, shook her finger in Brennan's face and shouted, What more could he have done for you? Brennan said at that moment, he pictured himself standing before the cross of Jesus, wondering, does God really love me? And Jesus' mother Mary pointing that finger at and saying, what more could he have done to you? That's what I want to ask this morning. What more could Jesus have done for you? He had the choice to destroy his enemies. He had the choice to save himself. He had the choice to change the ending of the story. And he gave it all up to save humankind, to save us from sin and death. Our actions define us. And in his worst moments, Jesus chose to suffer and die because of his love for us. When you look at the cross, can you really ask the question, does God really love me? And if God really loves us that much, what is keeping us from giving our lives to God today? I hope you'll pray and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior this morning. And in that prayer, you just might change the ending of your story too. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Holy God, we thank you that you gave your son Jesus who was willing to give his life for our sins. And 
instead of dying and being the end of life as we know it, instead we get life with you. Lord, we don't deserve it. And I guess that's the point of grace. But you love us anyway. Thank you for loving us that much. Lord, today, may we receive that grace and accept it and take Jesus as our Lord and Savior today and always. In his name we pray. Amen. Changed the ending. He could have saved himself. He could have destroyed his enemies. He didn't do any of that. It's the ending that brings us closer to God. He did it to save us. He loves you that much. I pray that you will accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And that as we go through this week and the weeks to come, that we will continue to follow and remember what he's done for us. Go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. May the rains fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, until we meet again, may God hold you.